Welcome to the Doc Rosa Frappuccino answering the review. Five, Doc Rose or Frappuccino answering? You decide. When a parent is training their child before going to school, normally there's just a lot of good things that the parent shares with the child. Uh, how to cook, how to tie their sneakers, how to do other hygiene items, and also how to play games and have fun. Yet, in preparing them for school, they have to start talking about the serious subjects, would you agree? Serious subjects like, don't talk to ones that you don't know, or the expression, don't talk to strangers, or if a person touches you this way or grabs you that way, make sure you either yell, scream, or run away, you see? So, the parent has to start talking about subject matters. Why? Because even at a young age, they don't want the child to be unarmed or unaware, some may even use the expression naive, that there just are some people who are not going to look out for their welfare and even hurt them, sad to say. Sometimes, after being in class for a while, too, you have uh, parents that teachers observe. You have some parents who teachers will say, boy, uh, their child um, uh, can do no wrong, even though the child is actually the one causing a lot of the problems. And then you also have some parents who child is the one being bullied, but may find it hard to believe that, you know, this much uh, pressure is being placed upon the child. And so by listening to uh, their child, you know, time in, com coming home, whether they seem depressed or what have you, the child may even ask a question at times, uh, Mom, why are persons treating me this way? I'm nice or... Uh, I didn't do anything to them. And so then the parent, even at that young age, yes, will start expressing to the child terms that they may not have heard before. Terms like jealousy and envy, which there is a difference. And that's what we're going to show here in this account in First Kings, that there is a difference between jealousy and and envy. This account really shows what envy is. So, in 1 Kings chapter 3, here are two women before a king. The king's name is Solomon. And in verse 17, it states, the first woman said, see, this is like a court proceeding. The first woman said, please, my Lord, this woman and I live in one house and I gave birth while she was in the house. On the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together, just the two of us. There was no one else with us in the house. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. So she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while your slave girl was asleep and laid him in her arms. And she laid her dead son in my arms. When I got up in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. So I examined him closely in the morning and saw that it was not my son whom I had given birth to. But the other woman said, no, my son is the living one, and your son is the dead one. But the first woman was saying, No, your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. That is how they argued before the king. Finally, the king said, This one says, This is my son, the living one, and your son is the dead one. And that one says, no, your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. The king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword to the king. The king then said, cut the living child in two, and give half to one woman and half to the other. 
At once, the woman whose son was the living one pleaded with the king, for her compassions were stirred towards her son. She said, Please, my lord, you should give her the living child. By no means put him to death. But the other woman saying was saying, He will be neither mine nor yours. Let them cut him in two. At that, the king answered, Give the living child to the first woman. By no means put him to death, for she is his mother. Did you notice how the king was able to decipher or find out the real mother? And yes, notice the expression in verse 26, where that other woman who had already showed such negligence about laying on her child, had said in verse 26, He will be neither mine nor yours. That's what it is in principle of thought of envy and jealousy, the difference. In envy, the person does not want you to have it, and it doesn't matter really whether they get it or not. They're not just jealous or crave something that you have, but they really just don't want you to have it. And so these are the expressions that you can share with a child to show that yes, be kind and dignify everyone, but always realize during this time of human imperfection, there are ones who won't treat you the same. Six, dark roast or frappuccino, you decide. It is the process of enjoying oneself with others, especially by dancing and drinking. If you are talking to someone between the ages of maybe 13 all the way up into their 20s, you may be talking about a subject that deals with having a good time. The definition that we just heard was the one of merrymaking. Now, different people have a view of what merrymaking is or just were humans placed on this earth to even enjoy life because of the things that they see around them at times. Well, let me tell you something or share this fact with you. Did you know for an infinite amount of years, so we're talking forever here, there was nothing but happiness, nothing but good times. Yes, in the personification of wisdom, which is talked about in the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs, they talk about the personification of wisdom, which really did represent a great being that was in the heavenly realm, the spirit realm, who was saying that when he was around his father, who made the universe, see, who had been living for an infinite amount of time, of years, we're talking forever, he was glad. He was happy all the time being around him. Now, those same beings wanted to share that happiness or love with others. How do we know? Because as you look all throughout the good book in the Hebrew scriptures, there are expressions of times when there are peaceful reigns, like with the King of Solomon, King Solomon, and other times that the people again were very happy. And as some translations put it again, they were merrymaking. And oftentimes, again, you will hear that the grand one himself was saying, I want you to be happy. And he wasn't saying that as he was taking things away from them, he was saying that as he was blessing them in abundance. Keep that in mind. As God was stating, you will be happy you must be happy because I'm giving you and I'm going to continue to bless you in abundance. So what does that show about happiness? It is equated with or put with, you see, commiserate with 
having an abundance. All right. Now we're not getting into how people say, well, you just got to be happy on the inside. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're still showing how throughout history, God, when he was making someone happy, when he was blessing them, it was due to an abundance as well that accompany his statement of being happy and wanting us to be happy. Let's go further. In the Greek scriptures or the New Testament, when you listen to Jesus who left his father in the heavenly realm to come to the earth, he expressed in his sermons happiness, how happiness would be fulfilled. And how would it be fulfilled? By an abundance of spiritual and material gifts too in the future. There you go again. Happiness being commiserate with an abundance of gifts of things being given to a person. Yet, continuing to move on even further, if Jesus did not make it totally clear, which he did, the abundance of writings in the scripture, God went further to show just how happy people would be. With the apostle Paul, he continued to talk to persons at times about, you know, with all this freedom that God has given us, We are a free people. That's what Paul said. Then he would make the, uh, basically the comparison sometimes of if we are free people, why are you bickering over things such as conscience and merrymaking and eating of foods and intake of this so that you are a free people? And yet, of course, he always said, just don't misuse it. Just don't abuse it, you see. And then when he was talking to someone that was between the ages of the teenage years all the way up into the 20s round about there, as we started off this Doc Rose and Coffee Frappuccino answering session, he started off his letter to him in one saying, God is the happy God. So what does all of this show us about happiness in principle? Well, it goes to show from what the God who has lived for an infinite amount of years, which we're talking about forever, has always been happy. And since he is the happy God, in principle, he wants all his people and creation to be happy. Seven, Doc Rose or Frappuccino answering? You decide. Parents are always preparing their child for the future of their adulthood. Sometimes it just comes naturally. And yet, there are times where parents will say something for a child or say something to a child today that they may have to recall again a year later, several years later, and even later than that. For example, I used to say in the podcast sometimes that it was certain uh, conversations or even actions my father would have me carry out even at a very young age where come to find out five to seven years later, he would reference actually that time or that day that I actually engaged in the item or whatever it is he was telling me about. And the profound effect, the memory recall that wasn't readily even coming to my mind at the time, when he brought it up, oh, it just took it right back to that very day, that moment, and what was happening. What an effect it has. Well, it's the same thing with parents today as they're raising their children. Uh, They are preparing them for the future to be adults. Now, bear with me a little bit longer on this because what I'm about to share with you next, you may say, Boy, what does this have to do with Doc Rose or Frappuccino answering? Well, just thank you for bearing with me. 
You know, I was looking up the Rubik's Cube and the Rubik's Cube con- contests that have been going on over the years. I think the Rubik's Cubes came out, what was in the late 70s? Certainly by the 80s, they were out, they've been around that long. And did you know for some of the competitions, I looked up the price that you could win up to $30,000. I wouldn't be surprised even more than that. For what? For actually just solving the Rubik's Cube, which again is a very uh, brilliant feat to do. As some people would say impossible, but we know it's not impossible because uh, many have done it. Now, there is also, uh, I guess you could say, a uh, evolutionarized, or if I'm saying that word the way I want to say it, way of using the cube. And it was called the Methods Oscars Treasure Chest Cube. The Methods Oscars Treasure Chest Cube. You could probably tell by the name that, hey, if you solve it, <laughs> then there certainly is a prize that's inside. You can put something in there, you know, whether it's a treat or jewelry or what have you. But what does the person have to do? They have to solve the Rubik's Cube to actually get that prize or treasure. Going along further, you know, there are certain things called uh, panic or mystery rooms today that a lot of people love uh, several times a year, if not more, if they can go to where you're actually placed together. Uh, some would do it by themselves, but mostly it's a team effort because, you know, you have to find clues and you have to be able to follow. Uh, OK, where you go next maps or what have you uh, in order to escape that maze you see in order to actually you know uh, again become free from that challenge and a lot of people enjoy it and we can go on and on and on with other examples how when a parent may purchase a pet you see like a dog or a cat and you know how it is sometimes especially with the dogs if you're actually cleaning the house or doing some other housework you see uh dogs might just want to come and help you and so sometimes they are placed in the room if not outside but if they are placed in the room sometimes you even have to lock the door because why uh they could probably turn the door knob and come out so you may have a key and let's say you know you just uh lock the dog in there with a uh, still you know some water or you know little treats or what have you and when your child comes home, you know, they may want to uh, see the uh, dog uh, uh, right away because, you know, you're through. And so you will give that child some instructions. You see, put a map in their head, so to speak, in order to go find where the key is stashed, whether it's on top of the refrigerator or in some drawers that they have to go through. And then what uh, they is search and they find the key and then they go and do what? Open the door and the dog is able to come out and play with them. So what is the principle in all of these matters of how a parent is training and preparing the uh, child for adulthood? Well, in John chapter eight, verse 32, Jesus said this, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And from these examples, you will see there is even a greater prize to learning the truth and being set free by the truth. But the key point is there is a truth because in each one of these scenarios, if you did not turn the cube and align things up just right, the cube just would not open up to a treasure. Same thing with the little boy or the little girl wanting to set their pet free. If they didn't follow the instructions the correct way, you see, staying true to what the parent said, that the key is on top of the refrigerator or it's on the drawer, you see, closer to a child's height or what have you, where they may have to scrounge to the back. 
to find the key by staying true to the parents' instructions, they're able to help, you see, release their pet. Same thing with the panic rooms and the mystery rooms and things of that nature. If the persons are not able to stay true to finding the clues and then following the directions after that and moving from room to room, you see, staying true once again to the directions, then they just wouldn't get out now, would they? So with all that being said, the principle is there are truths. There are important truths. And the principle of you will know the truth about the true God and Jesus himself that will set you free, that is a universal fact. It is a truth that cannot be avoided. And you know what? Aren't we glad we can't? Eight. Doc Rose or Frappuccino answering? You decide. But you know what the reality is today? This is a straight up Doc Rose strong coffee, if you will, prepared for you. Hi, I'm James, and welcome again to the Doc Rose and Frappuccino answering. In the opening of number eight, yes, I already answered the question for you on the part as you decide, because I know what I will share with you today is more on the Doc Rose side. You will see what I mean by that. Growing up, you have met many persons of different backgrounds and culture. Uh, most likely, even if you uh, came from an area that most of you, you know, had similarities, there's always some type of difference uh, that separates you from this personality or that personality. It may even deal with, you know, physical proudness and academics, uh, such as uh, grades in school. And one person you may encounter, if not many, is someone who is highly educated. Well, going on from middle school to high school, yes, they take advanced subjects. And even in those advanced subjects, they still make straight A's in that. And so what a feat that happens to be. Now, maybe you experience something like this. And I'm going to give you the concluding answer or statement of what you can say to such a person. And then I'll give you some verses as to why. What is that? Well, the concluding answer is sometimes all you can do is just leave the person with a positive. You just keep doing good. And hopefully Everything that we talked about will be revealed to you otherwise. What type of person this may be the outlook on or the statement that you have to conclude them with? Well, there was once a man, uh, well, again, still in high school, you know, advanced uh, subjects uh, were taken and, you know, good grades were made, A's still, even in those subjects. And he had a question still about God. And he wondered why he, <laughs> you know, could not find proof that there was a God. And he had conversations with <coughs> different people. And one person that he was kind of fascinated with because of his strong faith in God, even though he felt like, boy, you believe in God, but you don't have no proof at all. They had conversations going back and forth. And of course, you know, one of the arguments that he happened to use was evolution and things of that nature. And so at this time, uh, you know, the person who had a strong faith in God uh, <coughs> really did try to explain this or that with the knowledge uh, that he had at the time. Okay. Now, with that being said, the conversation still didn't change either ones of their minds. But you 
<laughs> know what that bit of experience gave the one who did have a strong faith in God, which he continued to see from time to time. <clears throat> and excuse me, you know, I, I drink coffee just before I started this and I kind of got something in my uh, throat along or something. But what he came away with was that he could see this person and persons that he would later encounter in life as as ones who, you know, this person doesn't believe in God, but you can see they want to believe in God. Now, isn't that something? You ever run into somebody like that? And so in order to leave them with some encouragement, you may just say, well, just keep doing <laughs> the best research you can. Keep uh, doing good. And if you have a question, you can ask me, okay? And <clears throat> sometimes that's all you can do. Now, why is that the case that we run into persons and God sound nothing like, you know, just like really a fairy tale or even uh, may even say his words in the Bible are fairy tales as well, which, you know, I would stay adamantly uh, with assurance and confidence when I tell you that they're not, that they really are God's words. Uh, he used men as like secretaries to inspire them. He allowed them to even express their own experiences in their of life. You know, I use King Solomon as one of them, one who experienced every type of uh, pleasure that you can at that time, you see, of life. And then put his conclusion of what he found out about it. And he found out with all his intelligence and all his enjoying pleasures of life that still the most important thing in life was to get to know God and please him by doing his will. Now, isn't that something? And, and that was the real satisfaction that he knew of. Some persons, uh, may be to the point where, no, they are not thinking about God at all. And there are ones who will straight up ridicule ones who uh, try to learn about God and put their faith in God. Why does this happen? Well, if you were to turn right now to John chapter 6, in John chapter 6, Jesus stated clearly in verse 44, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. And I like to share this verse with persons when sometimes they, you know, God has done a grand thing of a, a very loving, magnificent thing in providing his son, Jesus, for us to be forgiven for our, for our sins, you see, and be able to restore back uh, to perfect health, being able to live longer than a tree, which means living forever, and spiritually be sound in mind as well, you see. So this is a great offer. And sometimes, you know, as uh, he sends his messengers to ones, uh, they may view God as, uh, again, uh, not worth their time. And as if God is begging them, you see, like they need them or what have you. And that's not really the case at all. And so I'd like to share this verse uh, that there are some, and this is factual, that the reason why they won't get it is because according to John chapter 6, verse 44, the principle is, no, the statement, the fact is, no one can go to Jesus anyway unless God draws them. So what does that tell you? Thank you for being here. You have a wonderful day. You have just listened to the Perceptive Readers Podcast. Remember, until next time, if you read something that encourages you to improve or enhance your life for the better, it becomes your reality. So, Doc Rose or Frappuccino? You decide.